Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Cronin. I'm Justin Clark. And today we're discussing the future of fires. That means we'll get into man-made fires, wildfires, climate change, and more. But to start, I want to discuss the Amazon. So the Amazon has been in the news lately for all of the fires that are going on there. 20% of the Amazon has been cleared since the 70s when deforestation really kicked into high gear. And just in the last year, deforestation has increased by about 2x compared to last year. So maybe, Justin, you can say a bit about what's happening in the Amazon and why it's happening. Yeah, uh, I think probably the best place to start is to do a brief little history of how we got to this place. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing to note is the Amazon is full of resources, whether that's just wood, minerals, undiscovered compounds. I mean, it's just teeming with biodiversity and mm -hmm. there's so many untapped resources. So that's the first thing that we need to note. Um, at the same time, the Amazon kind of goes through some sort of burning around this time because it's the dry season. There have been burning years where the burning is higher than it is today. Mm -hmm. um, but So why is uh, there so much frenzy on social media and people like Leonardo DiCaprio speaking out this year as opposed to past years? Yeah, well, it, it, do, it has happened in the past. So in the early 2000s, there was a huge international outcry of the deforestation because like you said, it was terrible back in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. um, so in the earlier 2000s, um, the deforestation and the burning was kind of uh, largely cut back. Um, also at the same time, there was an economic boom in uh, Brazil. So there was like all the people just went to the cities because there were high paying jobs. They didn't need to be in the Amazon getting, you know, extracting resources from there um, right. but then there was then there was a recession so this is kind of where this all started uh, there was a, a recession back in uh, 2014 through 2016 mm -hmm. um, and this made people lose their jobs and go back to the Amazon for right. logging uh, farming and that's that could be legal it could be illegal the problem is Brazil doesn't have or they, they've tended to not enforce these uh, laws very well. Um, so now we're seeing the rise of burning and deforestation again. And, yeah. And, so, to, and, oh, go ahead. so I think to, just to summarize, so in the 70s, that's when the deforestation really began with the Trans-Amazonian Highway. Mm -hmm. And then... Soon thereafter, there was this big Save the Rainforest movement. I mean, I remember it in elementary school, like singing mm -hmm. songs about it and that sort of thing. So there was yeah. some progress made there in saving the rainforest. But then in 2014, when the recession hit Brazil, they went back to extracting value from the Amazon. And then most recently, Bolsonaro rose to power. And yeah. for those who aren't familiar, he's like the alt-right leader of brazil who has said very pro-business like anti, yeah very nationalistic anti yeah. so really just cares about brazil brazil's economy and doesn't care so much about what the effects may be in the long term or in the rest of the world or with indigenous populations and yeah he's openly like anti-indigenous populations because they're a hurdle that he has to go over to you know extract resources from here or from right the and he himself was caught fishing in a nature preserve by the people who enforce the environmental regulations and he refused to give his identity he made this big stance about it about how all these regulations against you know pr protecting the amazon are basically just a racket we need to get rid of them it's almost like the manifest destiny sort of mindset that the Europeans had in like the 1800s and 1900s where it's like you know this is Brazil's land and and for other globalist powers to say that we can't use our land and extract resources to help our people is hypocritical which it is in a certain sense because if you look at the US or Europe 
most of the land has been deforested there. So it's, yeah. it's not like Brazil is wrong to say that, hey, you guys deforested your own lands, and now you're saying that we can't deforest our lands. You're a hypocrite. But the key difference is, there's two key differences. One is that, first of all, we know a lot more now <laughs> compared <laughs> yeah. to the past. So to, to have the same mindset that we had in like the 1800s or 1900s is to completely forget about all of the scientific progress that's happened in that time. And the other key difference is that there's no other forest like the Amazon. It is it's the, the, it's yeah. the biggest carbon sink in it's the, the world. the biggest carbon sink. And, and what that means is it stores an immense amount of carbon in the, in the flora and that serves to cool the atmosphere, cool the climate. It also provides water and oxygen. And a really good example of what the big difference is in the Amazon opposed to somewhere else is if you look just right along the equator, and for those in the video pod, you can see Justin's map of the world <laughs> behind him. But if you look at where the Amazon is, it's actually, uh, it's actually closer to the equator than where most of the big deserts are in like Saudi Arabia and Northern Africa. So Northern Africa should actually be more lush than the Amazon if you're just going by how far away it is from the equator. But the big difference is the, uh, the Amazon is rainforest, so it's able to sequester carbon, maintain a cooler climate, a more moist climate, but in places like Saudi Arabia, it's just totally been eroded and there's just it's just hot and dry and it's in that sort of feedback loop where it's yeah. really hard for any moisture to retain in the soil. It's the Amazon is such an interesting place too. Like it's it's dependent on the Sahara Desert, for example, to some extent. Because I think I've mentioned for this the sand in the podcast and the soil. before. Yeah, the, the diatoms and the sand that yeah. is blown over the ocean and then is caught on the Andes over in like Chile and Peru. Um, then it kind of captures all of that fertile air and then keeps the humidity. And it's, yeah. it's and just the, an amazing. And the area. evapotranspiration is essentially it's like an ocean of clouds that trap water that move mm. through the jet streams all around the world. So most mm. of the rain or a great portion of the rain that we have here in the West of the US, like California, comes from the Amazon. It comes from the evapotranspiration that gathers in the clouds above the Amazon and then moves mm. across to the Western US. And since this is the future of fires, you know, California is one of the most hard hit places with fires in the in the most recent mm -hmm. years and that's going to exacerbate if the amazon continues to burn at the rate that it is yeah yeah and and the other thing to note um so we were talking about how it's a carbon sink the amazon is a carbon sink basically what that means is the plants trees brush grass it converts the co2 in the atmosphere to literally being part of its body so part of the tree trunk mm -hmm. or part of the leaves and when you burn that when you burn the trees and when you burn the grass and shrubs it releases all of that carbon back into the air right so it, it, it's it's kind of a double whammy so one that part of the amazon isn't bringing back any carbon or it isn't absorbing any carbon right but it's also releasing the carbon that it already absorbed. Exactly. And that's why, just to put it in perspective, burning one hectare of grasslands is the equivalent of 60,000 cars emitting carbon emissions for a year. So it is a massive amount of carbon that, that's released when these are burned. And, and that's of grassland, not, right. not necessarily. And, that, and that's a key right. distinction because I want to talk next about the distinction between a natural fire and a wildfire or and a man-made fire because fires are not natural in rainforests they are natural in places like the western us and other areas but it's not a natural occurrence to have these massive fires throughout rainforests some small fires yes they are natural yeah. but to the degree that we're seeing it's just not something that that type of environment 
is used to recovering from. And that's when they talk about these tipping points of if you deforest a certain percentage of trees in a part of the Amazon, it gets to a tipping point where there's not enough trees to capture enough moisture that then results in more rainfall in that area. And it just becomes drier and drier until it essentially turns into more of a savanna type of environment like you'll find in, in Northern Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, but Yeah, that, that's just a, a situation that um, it, it's crazy to think that the Amazon creates its own weather because of its trees. And when you start right. to disrupt those weather patterns, it, it could cause some really serious um, effects. And if the Amazon, if big chunks of the Amazon become savanna, and really there are big chunks of the Amazon that are being converted into farmland, which is just monoculture, there's not that mm. much biodiversity in this farmland. That's already creating issues. Right. And it's, it's honestly, to some extent less healthy than a savanna. Like well, yeah, the, it's a much it emits much more carbon when you have all of these cattle, you know, yeah. versus just having a grassland with wild animals and biodiversity. Cuz when you just yeah. have like monoculture with one crop for, you know, hundreds or thousands of acres, then that itself is a problem that the US and we talked about this in the future of agriculture, the US is seeing um really bad effects from that yeah so So i want to get into effects in the u.s and around the world but i think just to sort of round up the amazon part of this episode let's imagine that jair bolsonaro is listening to this episode and let's think about the reasons why he's supporting this and Mm -hmm. if it actually makes sense for brazil so let's assume Mm -hmm. we're talking to brazilians and if it makes sense for them Now, they would say that it's good for their economy because they're essentially not getting paid for any of the the positive effects that the Amazon is giving to the world. So in a certain sense, I kind of understand his perspective. It's like, yeah, this is, you know, people call it the Earth's lungs. Um, It's one of the major carbon sinks in the in the world. But Brazil isn't gaining any economic value from that directly. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, I kind of think an interesting solution might be what if globally countries pooled money and did sort of reward countries for good environmental protection of places that are important for the whole world? Like that could be an interesting, uh, an interesting path forward. But yeah. then I think the, the other question is even if we weren't to do that is this a good idea for brazil should they be taking the short-term gains of deforesting the amazon turning it into rangeland for cattle or is it a bad idea and one stat is that 70 percent of brazil's gdp is dependent directly on the amazon whether it's from tourism which is major in brazil Or agriculture is their other big, really big, uh, which is dependent on there being rainfall and that sort of, you know, all of the the climate that is that is created by the Amazon in that region. And then finally, there is some industry, but tourism and agriculture would be pretty much devastated if the Amazon were to disappear entirely. Well, so just to so for that agriculture piece of that, though. The, some of the burning and deforestation is directly because of agriculture, right. because they're clearing land for, you know, cows or, or right. just just regular crops. So I would... I'm, yeah, I'm not saying in the short term. I'm saying like in the long term. Imagine trying to raise all these cattle if it becomes like an area like Saudi Arabia or like... Oh, yeah. Long term, yeah. it's, it's not a good situation. It's not a good situation for anyone because you'll end up with a situation sort of how the plains of the U.S. used to be some of the most fertile land in the mm-hmm. world. And now they're just kind of like pulling, you know, they're just hanging on by threads and over fertilizing because there isn't enough fertility there. I think one of the things we talked about in the agriculture episode, for um, uh, just to kind of repeat that, is having polyculture farms mm-hmm. and and you could have these farms that 
are basically food forests. Or you could start to focus more on indoor vertical farming, and then you could have a lot of um, farming done in cities or near cities um, right. and keep the Amazon, you know, full of, you know, it could be tourism, it could be anything else. Maybe one of the things that I heard of Bolsonaro was talking about is creating dams in a lot of the um, river sections to for hydroelectric power. Hmm. Um, so there's a whole energy industry related to the Amazon uh, River. So that's that's something to consider as well. Yeah. Um, have you I heard really of like here? Oh, go ahead. Have you heard of prescribed grazing? Have you heard of this concept? Uh, maybe I don't know the exact term, but I mean it's sort of similar to the polyculture or just the whole idea of mimicking nature. But there's this fascinating TED talk. I heard about this guy who's literally been studying this exact topic of how to restore lands for, you know, decades. And basically what what we have learned over the last few decades is that originally people thought that okay, the land is starting to be desertified. It's not able to support the animals that are there grazing on the land. Therefore, if we remove some of these grazing animals by culling the herd, then the land will be restored. And this, is, this has been like common knowledge in biology for a long time, but it turns out to be pretty much completely false. And this guy who gives this TED Talk, he has this really emotional part of the TED Talk where he says that he published research that proved that there were too many elephants in the savanna. And so he recommended that 40,000 elephants be shot dead and they killed these elephants. And then deforestation got way worse. And so then he tried a completely different experiment. He was totally devastated by having the conscious of all those dead elephants on his, on his mind. Mm -hmm. So they tried something totally opposite. They brought in like tens of thousands of sheep and like cattle and they just put them in these areas that have been like deforested and eroded but they didn't just keep them there permanently like you would with tip the way that herders typically keep animals you instead keep them there for you know a few weeks or whatever and then you move them to some other area and you rotate them around and what this yeah. does is it mimics nature because in the past, you'd have these huge herds of, let's say, buffalo in the western U.S. And they would be eating all of the grass in this particular area. And their hooves would be aerating the soil so that new seeds can come up. And their dung would be fertilizing the soil. But then, as they're grazing, having a good time, predators would come up and sneak up on them. So they'd run away. And then they'd find some new safe place to graze. And because there were predators, there was never too many grazing animals. So this combination of predators and grazing animals and the soil with the, with the, uh, the, the forest or the grasslands, this would all work together to create this very healthy environment. What happened? Humans come in, we kill a lot of the grazing animals for our own sustenance. The predators disappear because there's not enough grazing animals for them to survive on. And then what you have is this land that isn't being fertilized by the grazing animals dung or, or urine. It's not being aerated. And instead where it's just, it's just eroding year after year. So the, the solution that this guy had this epiphany moment is that we need to do everything in our power to mimic nature. And the beauty of this is that not only can we restore our forests, we can also feed people in the process. So if I were meeting with Bolsonaro today, I would tell him that you can accomplish exactly what you're trying to accomplish. You can feed Brazilians. You can help Brazilians who are struggling in this recession, but don't do it through the, the flawed way of, of, uh, of agriculture and cattle herding that we used to do in like the 1900s. Mm -hmm. Move to the modern method that mimics nature by 
you know, using planned grazing where it's not just, oh, this farmer gets this land, this one gets this land, and you basically just just uh, use that land until it's no good anymore. Instead, you move them from place to place and you actually allow for predators to pick off some of the herd. And it's more of this holistic planning rather than like, I own this land and I'm just going to destroy this land until it, there's nothing left in it. <laughs> yeah. And, and the way to make that even more efficient is instead of using predators, you just use, you know, we use those animals as meat every once in a while. The exactly. You can feed people while you're restoring the land. It's a yeah, beautiful a, thing. Yeah. There's a couple of really famous farms I know in the U.S. that do similar things Well, the, where they'll have, you know, cows go in and they'll eat the top layer of grass and then move on to the next mm -hmm. little bit. And then they'll rotate in like chickens, turkeys and so on. And they'll just it'll be this cycle that uh, is sometimes even more effective than just regular nature it mimics nature but it takes it to the extreme so it, these these farms are extremely lush i know there's one uh just outside of la i actually watched a documentary i think it's called the biggest little farm or something oh big little farm oh yeah yeah. Something my mom awesome. loves that she watches that show <laughs> i actually uh bought some bought some food from them at the farmer's market a couple weeks ago oh, they really? have a little yeah. farmer's market in marina Interesting. Um, yeah, but I think I think stuff like that is huge. But I, I also want to go back to your idea of having some sort of economic value of preserving things mm. like the Amazon. And there's there is the the idea of countries pitching in and, you know, sending aid and other money to places like the Amazon, places like Southeast Asia where there's just lush jungle that we should probably keep intact right. but there's also an idea where you could create a market around it and almost you have a capitalism approach to it and i don't know if this is a good idea but it's it's one alternative that well, sort I, of accomplishes the same thing i think it's a fantastic I idea because i mean when you think about the role of government more than anything else it's positive externalities and negative externalities, things that the market isn't already solving for. So having a carbon tax to add the, the effects, the negative effects of emitting carbon into the economy is good for negative externalities. And then giving some sort of reward to countries that, that promote positive externalities like producing oxygen, storing carbon, cooling the atmosphere, that should also be accounted for. Yeah, and if, if there's some way to measure this in some way to create uh, markets around it where essentially uh, countries that are being a little bit less efficient, they have to pay, let's say, a carbon tax or a biodiversity loss tax or mm -hmm. a deforestation tax. And those taxes are then just redirected to places like hopefully Brazil that preserves the rainforest and right. stuff like that. So it's, it's like a, a market it, you can use the efficiencies of the market, but use a sort of control mechanism and, and, uh, the government to create the rules and create the incentives to, uh, you know, make sure everyone is aligned in this. And I think that's probably one of the best ways we can yeah, approach this. Cause I, I think, agree. I think Brazil I understand, I can understand that because it's probably frustrating as hell for the entire world to be like, no, you can't do this with your resources right. to a certain type of person. I mean, I, in, if I was a Brazilian, I would be like, I want to protect the rainforest as an American, I want to protect the rainforest, but we also haven't gone through a crazy recession, people starving, crazy corruption. I, I, so enough people cared about this and wanted to use the resources of the Amazon to elect Bolsonaro. Right. Yeah. He won 55% to 45%. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, he, his main um, campaign promise was we're going to boost the economy by, you know, kind of getting around this whole, like, yeah. Well, his other, his other big promise was really clamping down on, the homicide rate, which has soared in Brazil in recent years, the homicide rate is 6x what it is in the US. 
And the U.S. Wow. doesn't have that low of a homicide rate compared to other developed countries, given how many guns there are. So, you know, Bolsonaro wants a return to military dictatorship rule. He said that pretty much openly. His running mate is a retired army general who also wants a return to military dictatorship rule. So that's another factor. And that's part of why it's so critical when you think about like the worst case and the best case scenario, you can really see it going bad. Um, yeah. But we're going to save that for the future scenarios. But next, I want to talk about fire management and what it means to properly manage fires. And also, why have fires gotten more severe in recent years? And I was pretty stunned by the research that I that I found because I, I didn't know much much of anything about fire management before this. But I was stunned when I saw these photos of the 1930s national parks in the U.S., places that I've been. And they took thousands of photos on these mountaintops all around national parks. And if you look at these forests, they're totally patchy, meaning there will be trees over here, no trees, then some small trees, then some medium trees. But it's like this patchwork. It's not what you typically think of as like a lush forest of modern day uh, Western America, where it's just dense greenery for as far as the eye can see. So in that sense, it's maybe not as aesthetically pleasing to our monkey brains as the current forests are. But you can instantly see when you look at these pictures, and maybe I'll share them on our Instagram, that there are frequent fires. You can see burn trees over here, and you can see these massive trees that are resistant to fires for hundreds of years so essentially what happened since that time in the 1930s is people moved in they created roads and railroads those stopped the spread of fires right they also started uh, domesticating animals the domesticated animals ate a lot of the grass that was the conveyor belt for the fires and what the other thing they did is they started cutting down all of the big, massive trees that had been there for hundreds of years. And so what happened is over time, these big trees are gone. These smaller trees that aren't as fire resistant fill in all the gaps. The fires that do start pretty much can't spread because the cattle stopped all of the paths of where they could go. And even if it's not the cattle, the roads or the railroads will stop it. So then over time, you see that all of these patchy forests become Mm -hmm. dense forests of trees that are all pretty much the same height, but rather than these fire resistant and not fire resistant. So when there is, and then the other big factor is since the, this like the big burn as what, what they call it, which was, I think it was in, in 1910 yeah 1910 was the big burn and this essentially was a fire that was the size of connecticut that just destroyed all of this land in wyoming and and montana like spanning all of this that really started the modern firefighter movement where fire was seen as like public enemy number one and everyone did anything in their power to stop fires they stopped 95% of fires each year from that time until more recently. And, you know, that eventually evolved into Smokey the Bear, like only you can prevent forest fires and all of this. And this has cre- really created the perfect storm so that when we do have a fire, like the one that happened in Paradise, California, it is absolutely devastating because the fires continue to spread Another side effect is that with all these trees so close together, it doesn't just make spreading fires more easily. It also allows diseases between trees and insects to spread more easily so that now there are these dense trees, but a lot of them are dead or dying or they just Mm -hmm. die right there. And it's just this dry wood that's just waiting for the next fire. And then the, the final factor I'll say is that 60% 60% of all new housing 
is built in these areas with densely packed trees, places like Paradise, California. Because when you think of like, what's the land that hasn't been settled yet, most new developments are in these areas where the where it's like, you know, going up against where the forest is. And that's why when a fire happens, it is absolutely devastating, not only in the amount of trees that it burns and the amount of carbon that it emits, but also in the lives that are lost from these massive mega fires, which are fires that span more than 100,000 acres. Yeah, and, and to add just one additional factor, um, one thing we're seeing is um, some extreme droughts. You know, we have mm-hmm. some climate change issues that are just making some of the, the western states even drier than they had been. And mm-hmm. that could cause, you know, that's a problem in and of itself because when there's, there's less humidity, less, you know, less um, water just in the plants or on the plants or in the soil, then it makes fires even easier to spread. Right. Um, so it, it's just a, it's an even more perfect storm. It, it's, it's really scary to think about. But one of the things I learned that you touched on, you know, in the past um, several months is there were there are plants that are specifically adapted for mm-hmm. natural fires. And and when you describe these patchy fire or these patchy forests of the you know early 1900s, it it reminds me that you know there are certain plants that. Like eucalyptus, for example, and that's, I don't think that's something that naturally grows in the U.S., but they have their seeds encased in resin. And it literally depends on fire to melt this resin so then the seed can actually uh, be fertilized and grow into a a new eucalyptus plant. Mm -hmm. And that's something that kind of blew my mind. And there are also trees that, you know, don't have many leaves and branches in the lower levels and they just have these high canopies then and then the main part of the tree is sort of resistant to fire because you don't have these like pine needles that just catch fire and spread like crazy. Yeah, um, yeah just, their life so cycle depends on fires. So they're yeah. totally natural. And if you look at how, for instance, the Native Americans dealt with this 10,000 years ago, they actually supported burning and they would intentionally burn certain areas because they realized that if there are some fires in the spring and in the fall, then you can avoid the massive burns in the summer. And they also realized that if you burn some of the some of the area grasslands, it makes it easier for your uh, for the wild animals that they depend on that they hunt to propagate because they'll have more fertile land. So very similar to the to the planned grazing that we talked about earlier, this idea of fire management as opposed to fire prevention is is really something that goes all the way back to basically what happened, what, the way that we dealt with things before the Industrial Revolution and, and the Agricultural Revolution and when we were living off the land as more hunter-gatherers in line with with how the natural world evolved rather than trying to like control the natural world. And this one line from this, this guy really stuck with me where he says that there is no future without fires. That option is actually not on the table. Mm-hmm. So it's a matter of how do we deal with fires? Cause it's a fool's errand to think that we can prevent all fires or that all fires will magically disappear. So what he suggests is we should do more prescribed burning, meaning we burn areas intentionally. Let's say there's an area that's known that has many dead trees from diseases you know, passed by insects. We should burn that area and then that'll create a natural patchwork where when there is a big fire, it won't spread to the healthy trees. Um, yeah. Or another solution is when fires do occur, rather than trying to put them out, if we can direct them in the right path that's in line with, you know, the trees that are not doing as well or, or uh, you know, where it's not as close to where people are settled, then that would be a better path than just trying to, you know, stop the fires altogether. Right. Yeah, I think all of those are probably good um, solutions. And 
and I like the idea of prescribing fires because y you can be more, um, you know, you don't have to be reactive to a fire. You can create a fire line, meaning you, mm -hmm. you create a clearing so the fire doesn't spread beforehand rather than trying to scramble to create a fire line to protect these homes after the right. fire has already started. And so, then that puts the firefighter's life in, at risk. And it's, right. it's a really dangerous thing to do. So explain that because that's something I didn't really understand before this is what do firefighters actually do? Because I kind of always figured they were like, like forest fires. Yeah, I always figured they were out there like spraying water at the fire, but that's <laughs> not the so explain what a fire line is and what the, what firefighters actually do. Yeah, so I think the easiest way to describe it might be in the context of a grassland. Like it's just the simplest example. So let's say there's a huge brush fire, um, and there's tall grass that's burning and it's spreading rapidly. What a fire line is, is essentially you go and mow grass and you create mm -hmm. this like this little container, this little circle around the fire and, and you mow that grass and the mowed grass and the clearing that you create doesn't catch fire because it's just soil. There's no fuel, it, right? right? Yeah, there's no fuel for this, uh, this fire to keep spreading. So the fire line is just a barrier essentially. And the barrier isn't, you know, a barrier like a wall. It's just a barrier that is the absence of right. fuel for the fire to keep burning. So most of what firefighters do is like raking leaves out there in the forest rather than actually like spraying the fire itself. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's it, and it's very strategic where they place it because they know, you know, if there's a highway on this side, the fire is probably not going to go there. But there's some homes over here to the south side. So let's focus all our efforts on creating a fire line on the south side. And if it's really critical, they can also drop water from a plane that essentially creates a fire line all in one fell swoop because it wets that whole line. Yeah. Or even more powerful is if they actually drop fire retardant as a fire like line. That foam? Yeah. The foam stuff, yeah. But that uh, apparently just dropping one of those costs sixty thousand dollars. So wow. it's because it's like about three dollars a gallon for that kind of fire retardant. But if it's just water, you know, water's not as effective. But you can just fill it up if there's like a lake nearby or something like that. Um, so it is interesting just to think that firefighters are out there like raking like hell, <laughs> and then you just <laughs> dropping water to like create these fire lines, but. It's actually really rare for firefighters to try to actually put out a forest fire because it's it's pretty mm -hmm. pretty impossible once it gets to a certain size. Yeah, it's not at all like what you imagine. You know, a firefighter hooking up to a little uh, uh, fire pump and you know spraying a home. It, it's totally different from that. Um, right. But yeah, that, it's it's really interesting that you know there there are these different ways to approach fire management. Um, what are your thoughts on like the, you know, the the future? Do you think that there are new technologies? Because there's drone technologies that might make some of this mm -hmm. stuff easier. I, I'm curious if you read anything about. Yeah, you know, I I actually was expecting there to be more high tech solutions for fighting fires, but mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like there's any new game-changing tech yeah, that's going to Yeah, I really... found the same thing. Yeah, it seems like, yeah, we can make better and better fire retardants, but like I said, they're really expensive, and a lot of times it's just easier if you can just use a lake that's nearby so you can make multiple trips. But again, that only yeah. works if you're nearby a lake or an ocean or, or something like that. Yeah, um, the one thing that I was thinking, and this is something I didn't see at all because it's like way too far in the future, I think. But if there was a, if we could use robotics essentially, so we didn't have to put people at risk. And right. if there was, let's say there was this huge forest fire, it would essentially be like a forest clearing machine that would go through like a tree cutter, but a, or a, a, a mower or a, fo right. a forest mower. Mechanical clearing, go, they call that. Yeah. It, but it would be so effective that it could just clear it would make a fire line in really dense forest no matter what's there obviously mm -hmm. we don't have 
machinery that is that effective at destroying forest. And I would honestly be a little bit terrified of such a machine because it could, you know, clear forest pretty instantly if if we had that, if it was, you know, effective. But that right. might be one thing in the future that could be used in fire management. Maybe you could just it's, get like a giant glass top and just put it over the fire. <laughs> yeah, a little dome. Just, <laughs> just air, you know, yeah. it doesn't have any more oxygen, so you just starve it of oxygen. <laughs> yeah, but the I mean, the big lesson that I learned is that fires are not, the enemy they're not public enemy number one Smokey the bear was wrong it's really just about managing fires in a way that's in line with the way that nature evolved and that yeah. the the inputs work with each other to create a healthy ecosystem there there is a case to be made for you know being smart because there are a lot of human caused fires that, that right. aren't you know well let's so, get into let's get into those so i think we've we've done wildfires a, a good yeah, ju- good so deal just so talk about natural versus human cause uh, so, so what are the types of human caused fires oh i mean there's so many but a, a lot would just be you know if you're camping you start a fire it's accidental that, fires accidental fire yeah and then there's arson too which is you know well there's also burning trash which trash, is massive yeah. there's also cigarettes bur- Okay. That that would Go fall ahead. under accidental, I think. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But the, yeah, I mean, really, the big ones that I found are burning crops is the biggest, burning trash is also huge, and then accidental fires or or intentional fires like arson. Those are really the other ones. Yeah, but the those apparently happen at a much higher rate now than just natural fires because typically natural fires are started almost entirely because of lightning. Lightning strikes some some dry fuel and then that can sort of spark a fire of some sort. Well, that's natural in the sense of pre-human civilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could also, we talked in the future of earthquakes, how pretty much every time there's a big earthquake, some fires start because there are so many power lines that if those power right. lines yeah. get disconnected and they spark trees and and things of that sort. And there are just so many buildings made of wood that yeah. those can spark on fire pretty easily. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, before humans, lightning things. was probably the main cause, but now it's like there's so many, like the whole electric right. grid yeah. is, is uh, potential for fire. Yeah, um, and there's, there's not really any going back from that. We're obviously not going to go back to a civilization without electricity and without power lines like that so we just need to figure out how to manage fires and kind of the the theme that i think that we've been talking about is being in harmony with nature being in Mm -hmm. sync with nature understanding that there are cycles and there are things that we don't understand there are plants that are specifically adapted to this and and it's, it's something we just it seems like Early humans, you know, before the, like you said, the industrial revolution, the agricultural revolution, we were in sync with nature. We, mm-hmm. in the Native Americans, you gave that example. Where even just, even the modern day indigenous people of Brazil, of the Amazon, are living yeah. with nature. Yeah, and, and they're in tune with it. And then it was like we, we oversimplified when we got into this, this modern era for the most part. But, the, and maybe this, this is a... A time to get into the, the Euclidean. Well, yeah, I want to get into the scenarios, but I want to just touch briefly on the two other intentional causes of fire, which okay, is okay. crop burning and garbage burning, because these are yeah, yeah, yeah. massive problems. So we already pretty much discussed crop burning, which is that's what's happening in the Amazon right now. And usually it's either to fertilize the ground so you can grow crops or it's to clear the land so that you can raise cattle or other you know, farm animals. Yeah. Yeah. But like we said with planned grazing, it's actually a much better and more natural mode of operating to rather than rather than having this plot of land and then burning it and using that as fertilizer, you instead just move your animals from place to place with some predators so that they're fertilizing it with their dung 
but then they're not just staying there and eating all the gra the grass they're going on to new areas so that is what we should do instead of burning crops and that's not just in brazil it's also a problem in parts of the u.s and especially in places like india India, australia I australia think, has some issues yeah and then with garbage burning you know that's a massive problem too and the better solution would be reduce reuse and recycle meaning you separate out the garbage all by what type it is and if it's something like plastic that is not going to be able to decay for millions of years, then mm -hmm. you got to decide what to do with it. You might be able to break it down with microbiomes or you might need to like bury it in the so bury it deep in the earth. There's not a lot of great options for that. But with a lot of other materials, there are ways that you can recycle it and burning garbage is just an easy way to do it if you don't really care about the ex the ex negative externalities but we should we should really come to a global agreement against burning garbage because and against burning crops and i mean maybe we allow for some level of burning crops cuz we've literally been doing it like it's referenced in the bible i mean this has been happening yeah. for a very long time but it shouldn't be happening at the at the extreme degree that it is happening in India, like every year, New Delhi becomes just unbreathable because all of the crops that are burned and all of the yeah. wind gather in their that city. And uh, yeah. it's only going to get worse if we don't change our ways. Maybe that's a good cue to get into the worst case then. All right, let's do it. So what do you think uh, for the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario. My worst case scenario is continuing the trend that Bolsonaro has most recently embodied. So this is nationalism continues as a trend, not just in Brazil, not just in the US or the UK or Italy, but really all over the world, which is what we're already seeing right now. And you would hope that there's going to be a pendulum swing back in the other direction. But for this worst case scenario, let's say the pendulum does not swing. Let's say that countries like Brazil really view their resources as something that is just something they own and they're Brazilians first rather than human beings or conscious entities. So it's really a smaller circle of identity. And this is continuing the same mindset of the 1900s where it's about dominating nature, it's about controlling nature, it's about extracting value and caring about GDP more than happiness or long-term sustainability or anything like that. It's about being... Uh, willfully ignorant about all of the scientific learnings we've had in the last few decades and this idea of just being really persuasive rather than being grounded in the facts that we've seen with you know the rise of Trump and others where it's not as much about the truth of what they're saying it's just about how persuasive they are and I think Bolsonaro won the persuasion game in this last election and finally, it's not collaborating globally. It's just caring about your own, your, you know, the four year election cycle or whatever your election cycle is. And that's going to result in more mega fires that are going to kill more people that are going to destroy the Earth's biodiversity, which is going to be a, a huge impediment to making progress in medicine, developing new new drugs and treatments and in science in general. And the interesting thing is that where, while this started as sort of like a populist idea of, oh yeah, we deserve to you know, take, use these resources for our own people and our own economic gain, it's actually, in my mind, in the worst case scenario, going to have the opposite effect. Meaning as these resources get depleted and as these feedback loops go into effect, it's going to create a worse situation 
for people on the lower tiers of society. And because there's going to be fewer resources and because the, the climate is going to be more extreme, there's going to be more climate refugees and that's going to result in more nationalism where people tighten their boundaries even more. It's going to lead to more inequality where a smaller percentage of people are going to be able to do what's necessary to protect themselves and their families and pay for the resources that are now more expensive. And this could all culminate in some global armed conflict over resources. Like, for instance, between India and Pakistan, you know, there's a conflict in the Kashmir region right now where a lot of the water comes down from the mountains in Kashmir and there's a big fight about who gets to use the, that resource, you know, water being the most important resource for, for life. And we could see a World War III if we go down this path. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not so far-fetched to say that. And that's not necessarily my most likely scenario, but this is a not unlikely worst-case scenario. Yeah, wow. <laughs> um, that, that pretty much covered what I was thinking, but I want to reiterate a couple of things. Um, and that's the, the nationalism and this populism movement where people only care about their own people and we don't have this interconnected view of the world mm -hmm. where we we deny science and deny the fact that everything, every part of this world depends on some other part of this world. We, as humans, are all linked together in some way. And and that's something that, that, re that really touches on what we were saying earlier about this like simplification of this this vast system of earth you know what some call it gaia so, you know it's it's this this crazy situation that we're in and people are just ignoring it and i think i think when we ignore it and when we're willf willfully ignorant it's just going to create pretty much all the problems that you were talking about mm -hmm. um and and that I mean those are the two things. It's really the nationalism yeah. and this the science denial. Well, um, it's it's unenlightened thinking. It's like yeah. we've always known that there's sort of this monkey brain, you know, impulses that we have, and then there's sort of the higher self and it seems like we're doing a return to sort of the monkey brain where it's like we don't even want to know the science or the facts. We just wanna do yeah. what we feel like should be the case, even if it's been proven time and time again by science to not be the right path forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. All right. Well, what do you think for the best case scenario? Best case scenario. Yeah, so my best case is that we come together as humans, as earthlings, and we we stop this silly, like country between country conflict, and we actually create a unified global government. And I think if we create this global government, this this would reduce this this problem of the Amazon, you know, or the Brazil using the Amazon as only theirs. And we can sort of redirect resources the way we need to. We can create markets, like we talked about in the beginning of the mm -hmm. episode, that will um, penalize companies, organization, countries, or, or you know, maybe this is post-country. Maybe this is, uh, um, you know, they're just regions of the world where people live, and there are different cultures in these different regions. But anyways, different regions and organizations are um, economically... Um, benefited by mm -hmm. you know keeping these resources and some if they are having a negative impact on the world on society um, through their actions then they can be penalized and I think mm -hmm. I don't think there is a way in our current governance structure that this can happen I don't think that the UN yeah is strong I mean you can you can implement tariffs and uh and yeah. sanctions and that sort of thing but it's only really powerful if you have enough countries behind it because right. for instance with the trade war between US and China that has resulted in China buying far less soybeans from the US than they used to what is Brazil doing right now they're burning Thanks. the ground and making soybeans 
So it's all interconnected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's not there's not going to be a time when we can truly collaborate as humans and truly reach our potential as humans. Like I'm constantly amazed at what we have become. From monkeys, we can now be having this conversation over Skype, over <laughs> some some cords that are sending bits from my computer to your computer yeah. across the country. We're, we're doing this. Like we have such amazing potential, yet we're also so ignorant in other ways. But I think if mm-hmm. we can really come together, like we could see a human civilization so beautiful and so amazing that it's inconceivable right now, but you mm-hmm. know, that, that is sort of the best case. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. And just a couple other points to highlight that we talked about. So in the U S one very quick and easy win that we could make is changing the laws around prescribed burning to mm-hmm. allow for more prescribed burning. And that would be a way for us to return to the more natural patchy forests of the past. And that would prevent some of the devastating fires in the future. And another point, like we mentioned earlier, is planned grazing. So if we can get it through to Brazil, to farmers in the ranchers in the US, ranchers in Europe, ranchers in Australia and Asia, that the better long-term method is not to just have a plot of grand where you have animals and you destroy the land and then you go to the next land, but to sort of share all the land and have these big herds that move from place to place and having predators. And the beauty of where we are right now is that we have the technology to have all of the comforts of modern life in nature. We don't need to have concrete square blocks of buildings and all these roads. Like we can grow lab grown meat. <laughs> we can yeah. like there we can uh, have these eco friendly homes that still have super fast Wi Fi. We can fly from we can fly from place to place and we don't necessarily need roads everywhere. Um, you know, there are right. or underground. Or underground, know? yeah. Like there are so many potential solutions. So when you see a modern country uh, moving in the same direction that we were in the 1900s without taking into account any of the amazing technology we have today that is better for the environment and for just long-term sustainability and long-term economic viability, mm-hmm. it's really sad. And, and I, yeah, I mean, I guess we should get into the most likely next. Most likely scenario. I'm a little bit optimistic here, um, but at the same time, I'm a little pessimistic, and I'm I'm at conf- I'm conflicted at, mm-hmm. in what I think is the likely scenario. So, one of my likely scenarios is, I think we are in an age where people are more open to science. I think people are moving away from dogmatic thinking and realizing. Mm-hmm. And even scientists are becoming more informed about the cycles of the world, that there are, you know, there are reasons why fires existed, or there are plants that are adapted to fires, and there are, there are important um, roles that fire plays in nature. So I think that people are starting to realize that this is more of a system than it is just the simple, you know, black and white sort of na- uh, world. Mm-hmm. And I think think and I hope that this is something that um, kind of spreads to the general population we can be a little bit more nuanced in how we we view things and and this could um, extend to farms because there are these innovative farming practices coming out and they seem to be much more widely accepted than they used to be Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's these these uh, innovative uh, pasturing or, or pastured uh, animals or um, using polyculture rather than monoculture, all of these things, which ultimately lead to, you know, if this, if this information is out there, Brazil can't be ignorant so long. I don't think they're going to destroy right. the entire Amazon. And I think that the Amazon is in a good place uh, geographically 
for it to not necessarily be, you know, at risk of being a desert. I don't think it's going to be desertified, if that's a word, (laughs) desertified. Um, uh, So, yeah, I I think we're probably in an okay situation, but I do think it's going to get pretty bad and there's going to be a lot of uproar, especially regarding the Amazon, Mm -hmm. before it gets fixed. Because there is a, I mean, I don't know um, how much longer... um, Bolsonaro will be there. Hopefully, it's only one term, or it less could turn than one into term. a military dictatorship, though. Yes, and yes, could it be could. for life. And yeah. that's that's what I was uh, sort of pessimistic about, it's right. specifically regarding the Amazon. Um, I do think the rest of the world will probably try to do the, everything they can. We've already talked about the U.S. and Europe have already talked about slapping sanctions and tariffs and all of these other things on Brazil to make sure they don't do this. But I, I just think we need a more holistic solution. Yeah. I mean, I, I must say I share your optimism. And ultimately, it comes down to the conscious states of humans worldwide and yeah. what people think and care and believe in. And it's interesting because when you think of our ignorance in the 1900s and then with the rise of the Internet, People like Mark Zuckerberg thought that, oh, if we just connect everyone, then all of our problems will go away because we'll all be connected. What happened is we got connected and then people just became even more tribal than they used to. Yeah. But what's happening now is I feel like we're going through a transformation where we're able to face that tribalism and rise above it. And it hasn't happened yet, but I think that process is happening. I think especially with like the Gen Z generation and just younger generations that sort of grow up with with the internet, like extremely online people, mm-hmm. they're going to have such more nuanced views of what's true and what's not and who's just trying to persuade them and everything like that, that I think a lot of the misinformation and propaganda is not going to be as effective in the future so long as information can still flow freely, you know, so this excludes something like, uh, like, you know, China or something where they have such control that, or like North Korea, where you can't really know what's what people are saying. But I do think that over time, we are going to become more enlightened. And although, you know, I don't want to make my most likely scenario seem too rosy, because I think while I think that we will learn our lesson when it comes to fires, the question is, will we learn our lesson soon enough? Mm -hmm. Soon enough to save the bulk of humanity, not soon enough to save Mother Earth. Mother Earth will be fine. I mean, we talked about this before, even if all the Amazon burns and there's, you know, we go to war, World War Three over natural resources and most people die and the people that are clear fallout. Yeah, like, like. even if that happens, the earth will regenerate over the next however many thousand years. So really what we're talking about is the future of everything we've built as humans and as a civilized society and the animals that we care about and the biodiversity that we care about. And will yeah. we be able to come to the proper realizations before we've done too much damage to what we care about? And that still is an open question. But I, I do seem I do feel more optimistic on this topic than on others, uh, specifically because of how much response there's been in trying to protect the Amazon. And that's why I agree with you that I don't think that human society would allow the Amazon to be burned entirely without some massive uproar and some real decisions getting made by um, yeah. you know, international organizations. Yeah, and we are becoming more informed. So I think, and that is one benefit of social media is we know about these things mm-hmm. immediately. Every, yeah. The whole the whole thing about the Amazon spread way quicker than it did back in the early 2000s because we have, you know, much more effective means of spreading this information. So that's that's a positive. You know, there mm-hmm. we could talk about the negatives of social media all day, but it's hard to deny some of these positive benefits too. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. 
So thank you everyone for We're listening. This has been what the has Future happened, of Fires. What is currently and happening, we'll see you next time. And what will inevitably happen. The past, the present, and the future. Our computer is picking up a strange signal. The past, the present, and the future, baby. What's the world coming to? The past, the present, and the future. Hey futurists, if you've made it this far, you might be wondering who created the Hence the Future theme song. It was created by the Walden Brothers, and you can find them on Spotify. The Walden Brothers also produced the sound bites for the worst case, the best case, and the most likely future scenarios. At Hence the Future, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of our episodes and our predictions. To that end, we're building a team of researchers to curate the most authoritative and highly vetted sources as the foundation for every episode. If you'd like to support these efforts, you can donate a small monthly amount at anchor.fm slash hence the future. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support.